Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope you have, you ate your breakfast. We have a lot of slides to go through today. So this will be a lot of fun. So when we last spoke, I presented to you a sermon entitled Petra, which is the sure foundation. And we're kind of making our way through this model. And Petra serves as the foundation. We are going through the pillars. These vertical structures here are the pillars and on which the messages of present truth actually sit to hold, uphold the platform of eternal truth as defined by Ellen White. The previous sermons in blue have already been recorded and are maybe available. I'm not exactly sure. But last, when I spoke, we spoke about Petra, the foundation, and I just wanted to highlight a couple elements from that sermon that will help us transition into today's topic. The focus was on, it was a Christmas theme, and I was going to focus on the 70-week prophecy. So we know from, as good Adventists, the 70-week prophecy talks about 70 weeks, and we know that starts in 457 BC. And in 457 BC, terminating in AD 34. And AD 34 represents the close of the 70 weeks. And we know that by Daniel 9.25, from the commandment to restore till the Messiah shall be seven weeks, three score and two weeks. So 69 weeks or 69 prophetic weeks or 483 actual years. And that ends in AD 27. And we know that in AD 27, Jesus began his public ministry. And he will confirm the covenant with many for a week. And that week is one prophetic week or seven years. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And we know that in the middle of a week or three and a half days, that's when the sacrifice would prophetically cease. And we know that Jesus's ministry was exactly three and a half years or stated another way, seven, 42 months or stated another way, 1260 days. I wonder if those have any significance. And we know that this is biblically true and that our understanding of prophecy via the grammatical, historical grammatical hermeneutic is actually true. And that's what we talked about at the last sermon. In that, Simeon, as mentioned here in Luke chapter 2, the Holy Ghost revealed unto him that he would not see death until he seen the Lord's Christ. And what, did, what was Simeon able to put together? Numbers 4-3, from 30 years old upwards, even until 50 years old. And that's when the priests would enter the service of the, the sanctuary. Jesus could have easily started his ministry at age 18, age 21, age 23, some random number. But Jesus specifically started at age 30, as mentioned here in Luke chapter 3, 23. And Jesus himself began to be about 30 years of age, being, as he was supposed to, the son of Joseph, which is the son of Heli. That's when Jesus started his ministry. So Simeon, what he did is he figured that if the Messiah is going to present himself after 483 years, that will be AD 27, he backdated it 30 years, and he came up with BC 4. And that's how the Holy Spirit said, you will not see death until you've seen the consolation of Israel. And so that's how that was the crux of uh, the last sermon that we that I preached for you all. And that is the fulfillment, as Jesus mentions here in Matthew 3, 15. And Jesus answering and said unto him, him being John the Baptist, suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And so what, what John the Baptist was being asked here to do was, to loosen Jesus's sandals and to baptize him. And if you recall, Jesus was without sin and the baptism that John offered was a baptism for remission of sins. And John knew that he was not worthy to even loosen his sandals because Jesus was without sin. And, but Jesus said, suffer it so because there needed to be something. And that is when AD 27 was fulfilled, that the, the 69 weeks uh, prophecy was fulfilled, and these were all necessary for God's plan of salvation to continue. 
one thing that I wanted to focus on now is this phrase here from Daniel 9, 27, and he shall confirm the covenant. And the confirming of the covenant is something that we don't do at all. This is not something that exists in our modern uh, day and age. And I wanted to explain what a covenant is, because this is something that we toss around, but we don't really understand what it meant in the context of Jesus' day and even in Daniel's day when he wrote this, because this is in the near oriental tradition. And these are things that unless you study this, you're not going to understand exactly what a covenant means. So in the scheme of things, today we will be studying Pino, which is yet another pillar of our faith. How do we know this? Testimonies of Church, Volume 6, page 91. The ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. So baptism being outside the church as a, as a means to get into the church and one within, meaning the Lord's Supper. So once you're inside the church, this is something that stands as a monumental pillar in the church. Upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of the true God. So many people who talk about the pillars fail to comprehend or include these two aspects. And I want to challenge you that the Lord's Supper represents not just a transition of economies from the sacrificial system to now Jesus's uh, pure sacrifice on the cross, but represents a whole lot more. And I hope for you to be blessed by today's sermon. Scripture reading this morning is in, uh, from Matthew 26, as was read. But I say unto you, I will not pino henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I pino it new with you in my father's kingdom. Sermon entitled this morning is Pino, Refreshing, Strengthening, and Nourishing, shall we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that your son did confirm a covenant with many for a week. And that through that confirmation, we have been made heirs, sons and daughters of the Most High God. That is a true high calling, but Father, we are but dust, and our lives are but hand breaths in you, and there is no good from us, and we are but sinners. So forgive us from all our sins and our shortcomings, and cleanse me that I might be able to give a word in season for your people, that they will see Jesus uplifted, and we will see the glory of your plan and the beauty of your Son. This is my prayer in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The word pino in the Greek is used 75 times in the New Testament, and it simply means to drink. But the secondary definition, as you can see, is a figurative speech, to receive into the soul that which refreshes, strengthens, nourishes it unto life eternal. Life eternal. And you're probably thinking, what in the world is he talking about? And that's exactly where I need you to be. But I need to first ask a couple questions. Specifically, why did Jesus say, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine again with you in, 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 until my father's kingdom? Jesus could have easily extended his ministry for another year, gone another cycle, and had another communion. Okay, There could have been another Passover. But why didn't he do that? And I want to introduce you to the radical concept of a covenant. But instead, we must first start with a contract. Contract is the modern way in which we conduct business. And I was looking for a good infographic of this, and this is probably the best one that I found. You can see here, when we do contract processes, these are all the different stages. First, somebody requests, hey, I need your help. And then you got to come to a generate some kind of working model to say, hey, you know what? I want you to do this. You're going to do this for me. And then we're going to negotiate. We're going to say, hey, you know what? That's too much. I don't want to work that hard. Or I want you to do a little bit more here. And eventually, once we come to that, we get to uh, agreement. We get to approval. Then we execute it. Then after that, we have a signed, captured contract. And now there are terms which we are need to comply with. And we check back to make sure, are we actually fulfilling all the steps of this contract? Sometimes we might need to review or maybe even amend the contract. 
And then sometimes it needs to be renewed because there's usually a time period. This is the way contracts work. And if the contract is violated, then we see the judicial system. So I can sue you for failure to manage or to come through with your contract obligations. But God did not enter into a contract with man. Rather, he introduced the concept of a covenant. And this is foreign for you, but I want, this is probably one of the best models that I found out there on this. This is from a book by, it's called The Family, A Christian Perspective on the Com Contemporary Home by Balswick and Balswick. And basically what you see here is a spiral. And the spiral is meant as you go through the different circle, as you go through a revolution, what happens is you get into a greater degree of commitment. So you can see you go from one to two to three. So you have increasing commitment there. But, you know, whenever you get into uh, it's while a covenant is similar to a contract, there is an element of grace. And this grace is gives you longitudinal ability to grow. For example, as you grow, we're going to make mistakes and a bigger person in the relationship will allow those mistakes to be made. But because love is the foundation it allows the leniency and the patience for that for one to grow. And that leniency then leads to a degree of empowering. So once you can empower somebody, then all of a sudden they grow. So you don't need as much grace. And ultimately, the result is intimacy. And that intimacy allows for a tighter and tighter covenant and that's what god has been looking for all the time god doesn't say you've sinned let me go take you to court and claim my damages instead god is gracious he's ever so gracious and he gives us gifts to empower us and he calls us for a degree deeper degree of intimacy and so this is a concept and a model and a framework of covenant that I was introduced to several years ago. And I found this to be probably the best explanation of a covenant. And I hopefully this is something that you adopt as you understand and as you grow in your Christian walk. And then this is from the book. I'm going to take a paragraph out of it. And this is the paragraph that's associated with this specific, this specific image or the figure. The logical beginning point of any family relationship is a covenant commitment, which is which has unconditional love at its core. Out of the security provided by this covenant love, grace develops. In this atmosphere of grace, family members have the freedom to empower one another. Empowerment leads to the possibility of intimacy among family members. Intimacy then leads back to a deeper, deeper level of covenant commitment. And that's the whole point. It's supposed to spiral and it's supposed to get closer and closer and tighter and tighter. And that's what God wants. And here's just a, yet another iteration of that. So the covenant is to love and to be loved. The, the grace is to forgive and to be forgiven. Empowerment is to serve and to be served. And the intimacy is to know and to be known. And the whole point is to get deeper in all of those elements to get to that core. And that's what God has been trying to do with us. That's why he's been going for us. And so the greatest example of a covenant in modern society represents a wedding. And as we have all been to a Western wedding, there are a couple phases. There's first the dating period, then there's a proposal, then there's an engagement, and then there is a wedding. Okay, but I wanted to change this and put this on its head and show you what the Jewish wedding is. And the Jewish wedding has two phases. There's the first phase is called the Kedishuin, and the other one is the Nisuin. Please excuse my Hebrew, not that you could judge me, but I'm butchering these names and I claim to not have any training whatsoever. I'm just pronouncing them as phonetically as I can. So the first phase of the Kedishuin is the mohar and then you have the shitre arusin and then you have the chadar and then there's a period after which this chadar you are now officially betrothed 
So when Mary betrothed was found with child with Joseph, she was officially betrothed. She had already gone through these first three stages. Then what ends up happening, that's why Joseph had the right to put her away when we first read the story of Mary and Joseph in the New Testament. This is where she was in this sequence. Then there comes an Epirion, and then there becomes a Ketubah. And these are the ones that I found to be most consistent. There are various types of Jewish weddings, and these were the ones that I found to be most consistent dating back through many different lines of study that I was able to do. So I wanted to, I used the Encyclopedia Judaica, and I wanted to go through these phases. And so the first element is choice. And so I want you to see this. And this is speaking of Hagar, speaking where the son Ishmael, and he went into the wilderness of Paran, and that's he being Ishmael, and his mother being Hagar took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. And this is Genesis 21, 21. As parents, I think we love this verse. I think we love it a lot. Because if you notice here, who did the taking? Hagar did the taking. So Hagar basically told Ishmael who to marry. Uh, as a parent, I love that. I love that concept. There, there is little to no choice for the child. And it's the parent who gets to choose the spouse for the child. But we no longer live in those times. Genesis 28, 2. Now the context here is Isaac speaking to Jacob. Arise, go thee to Pandanaram, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So notice here, Isaac is giving Jacob the ability to choose his bride. And so we know the story of Joseph and Jacob and Laban, and we'll enter it. We'll see that. And so you can see here in this one, the concept that you see here is directed dating, meaning the, the father will permission dating under very strict lines again as a parent you love these concepts these are very biblical so if you want to institute biblical dating i think these are great foundational verses for you to use okay now the next phase after you've chosen your wife is the concept of mohar and mohar is effectively a dowry and notice here what it says in exodus if her father utterly refused to give him to her to him he shall pay money according to the dowry of virgins and so there was a price to be paid and if we looked at this price deuteronomy 22 says that a damsel is worth 50 shekels of silver so i forgot how much silver is trading these days but that's not a lot of money and that's the going rate for a deuteronomy era bride so I hope, women, you're not offended by the fact that we've modernized a little bit. So continuing on, sometimes the payment is not monetary, but actually in service. And here we see Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will serve thee, thee being Laban, seven years for Rachel, thy younger daughter. So he gave seven years of his life to Laban, his father-in-law, in order to be able to marry her because he did not have even 50 shekels of silver for Rachel, or maybe the price was higher. Okay. And the next phase after the wedding has occurred is gifts are given. This is the Rusin Shitre. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment and gave them to Rebecca. And he also gave to her brother and to her mother precious things. And so this is again Jacob giving the dower or the, the gifts to Rebecca the sister of his supposed bride. But Laban did a switcheroo and he he swindled and got another seven years out of Jacob in order to get Rachel in the end. So, but notice that there is a gift that the, the bride gives, okay? And then there is a phase where you go into the chadar where the, the bridegroom goes into his chamber and uh, the bride goes into her closet. And this is supposed to signify that now once you're married and once you've showered, the bride with gifts, you go your separate ways. So while you're betrothed or engaged, 
you're not living with each other. And the reason why you're not living with each other is because the groom has to actually make some preparations. And the preparations here, especially in the Old Testament times, is the groom had to prepare a place for his bride to come back home with him. And it was a very communal community at the time. If I wanted to bring my wife home, my fiance home, I would go to my father's house and start building an extension to, to his house. I'd build a new wing. So I'd have to get the permits, get the, the materials, and actually start building it. And the bride and her spies would spy on the progress so did he get the did he pull the permits? Is the foundation up? Has they even dry has he even mudded the drywalls yet? You know, what's taking him so long? So they can actually see the process of the building of this place. And then on the bride side, the groom sends his spies to kind of check on her. Is she honoring her commitments? Is she dating other guys? And during this time, this is where the bride is supposed to learn all the things that would please her husband. What is his favorite dish? What can I cook for him? What is his favorite song so I can sing it for him? Small things like that so that way you can learn to please your husband. And only when the father said that everything was settled and it was of good enough quality could the groom go get his bride. Why? It, because everything now depended on the quality of the construction of this new house that his son was going to make. If his father was going to let him build a shack and just put something up, then everyone in town would know like, don't marry, don't let, don't marry any of his sons because look at this quality. This is poor stuff. It's shot. It's not going to pass inspection. The roof leaks. And so only when the father gave the okay could the next phase begin of the wedding? And that is called the aperion. And the aperion we know is behold, the bridegroom cometh. And so this is the context in which we see the 10 virgins. So the context of the 10 virgins, if you look at the passage in Desire of Ages, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he's taking advantage of view of Jerusalem and he sees the bridal procession. Usually this happens at night. So there's a torch, torches, and you see the, the whole uh, crew and the gang all moving from one location, snaking their way through the streets to go to the bride's house to go get her. And the concept of the 10 virgins were these were select friends of the, of the bride who were supposed to accompany the bride for this, for this, for this procession. And this is a reenactment of what this procession might look like in terms of the groom and his groomsmen trying to go get his bride, and then the train of bridesmaids following after her. And so this is the context of the 10 virgins. And so once, once you snake through the entire Jerusalem, you go back, then the last phase of the wedding is the ketubah. And this is a modern ketubah. And what a ketubah is, is basically a bunch of promises. And these promises were actually made right before, I forgot to mention this, before the giving of the gifts and after the bride consents, they will drink a cup of wine. And this cup of wine is supposed to signify that they are now betrothed. And at the end, after the groom has gone to grab his bride, they will again rehearse these promises, which is the ketubah, all these promises and some of these promises were as basic as I will provide you enough firewood that you will cook every day. I will provide you enough oil that you will be able to have light at night. These were the simple things that I came across as being promises that will fulfill this ketubah. And so this was rehearsed. And then again, these same promises were rehearsed once the bride and the groom were back in their uh, at their place. The, and then they would smash the glasses of wine, and then that's when the wedding party would start. And God instituted this form of wedding so that way it was supposed to be a social extension and practice 
but it was also meant to have spiritual implications. And so you see here the admonition in Exodus 34, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a whoring after their gods, and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. And so here, this is where God specifically said that you are not to marry outside of the of their faith. And it was supposed to be protection against idolatry. Again, this rings true again in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter shalt not take unto his son, nor thy, thy, his daughter shall take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. And so that's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we see the admonition we all have known. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And notice Paul uses really stark contrasts here. Light and darkness. Not shades of gray with shades of gray. But he's basically showing that these are polar opposites. And that's the admonition that God meant as a barrier so that way we could stay pure and true to him. Um, Ezra says the same thing. And here's a promise for why this would be the case. That ye may be strong and eat the good of the land and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. That's why God wanted to do this so that way he can be our God and continue to bless them. And we would preserve the distinctiveness that was part of the Jewish race at the time. Okay. Strange wives again means adulterous and different. Okay. And notice here this passage out of Ephesians 5. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish, Ephesians 5. Notice here, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. And in so doing, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they two shall be one flesh and that join there is that cleaving that god meant for them for for jews to have and this was also a, this is notice what paul is saying here this is the great mystery but i speak concerning christ in the church so while it is a social construct that they do custom that they follow in society this was actually meant to be a spiritual and so too the jewish wedding carries with its spiritual implications so the mohar or the price of a bride, for ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And that price is a very precious one. Take heed, therefore, unto yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the flock, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So notice here that it's not with gold and corruptible things. That's what First Peter goes on to say. For, for as much as that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. And that is the challenge that we are to do. The gifts... Here, Jesus answered and says, not what she asked. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of and to be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? They say unto him, we are able. So remember, if, if we drink that cup, then God will shower us with gifts. And notice, I love this passage. It's one of my favorite. For all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. So in Christ, those promises are always yes. And that is a wonderful thing. And notice here what those gifts are. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? 
you know, especially around Christmas time, we think that we're good parents because we do this, that, and the other thing. I'll tell you, God has outdone us for all eternity because he has the Holy Spirit ready to give to us if we but ask him. And the Holy Ghost, again, is that gift that we ought to receive. And this is where Jesus goes to prepare a place for us. This is one of the, the, the famous promises that Jesus gives. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And this is what Jesus is doing for us now. And he is preparing for us places. But are we keeping our end of the bargain up as well? Notice here, but of that day when Jesus comes and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the son, but the father. And so notice here, that if you were a Jew and you understood that Jesus was saying these things, you could see the overtones of a wedding in this because this was commonplace. This was custom in their day. So it was well understood in their day. And notice here, Zechariah 14, 5. And he, ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, and the valley of the mountains shall flee into Azal. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from the earthquake in the days of King of Uzzah, king of Judah. The Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. And that's going to be a wonderful day when Jesus comes. And then our scripture today, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So what Jesus is basically saying here when he comes to get us, that's the aperion. He will come to get us. That's the second coming. And then when we get to heaven, we will have the greatest celebration, and that's the mar marriage of the, the Lamb, marriage feast of the Lamb. And that is mentioned here in Revelation 19. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And so hopefully I've kind of explained how Jesus has confirmed the covenant with many in the in leaving us with a new tradition which basically took the economy or the celebration of the passover fulfilled it with his own death and introduced to us a new tradition and ceremony in the communion and in so doing he was able to confirm that covenant but i want to share with you something in the preceding verse daniel 9:26 and this is something that unless you do a, a deep dive, you will not really understand what this looks like. Notice here what it says. After three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. And that word translated in English to cut off means karat, to cut. And it also means to covenant. So what does that mean? To make a covenant. If you guys have never seen a study on biblical covenant making, hold on to your seats. This one will be a lot of fun. There are nine phases. We'll go through this really quickly. Step number one, exchange of the robes. Two people will exchange coats or robes. And to a Hebrew, the coat or robe represented the person himself. So when he offered the other person his robe, he was offering himself, even his very life itself. Wow. Does that sound like 1 Corinthians 5.21? He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Praise God. Step number two of the covenant, exchanging of the belts. So, as, the, as we prayed earlier about the bullies, so to our young sister Faith, I want you to pay attention to this one specifically. To exchange the belts, they take off their belt and they offer it to the other person. The belt, also called the girdle, was used to hold the sword, your knife, and other fighting instruments. In this way, you were saying to the other person that you were offering him your protection. If someone attacks you, they will also have to deal with 
they will also have me to deal with. Your battles are my battles. And like, I want to exchange belts right now. And God wants to exchange belts with us. Notice here what it says here, Luke 10, 19. Behold, I give you, I've given you authority to tread upon the serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy that nothing shall injure you. But remember, there, there are terms for this. And this is Ephesians 6. Therefore, take up the, a part of the armor of God. No, Paul says, take up the full armor of God. And this is where it's important. And I want us to kind of go through this very quickly. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Notice that the very first element is truth. Because if you don't have truth, you put all the other parts, all these other parts, and you, but you have lies, you're not going to be a great soldier. So notice that Paul uh, uh, writes to the uh, church in Ephesus that the very first element should be truth. And then after that, blessed pace of righteousness, your feet uh, prepared with the gospel of peace. And then from there, the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming missiles from the evil one. And then the helmet of salvation and then the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. All those elements are need to be put together in sequence. And it's not you take the word of God and use that first and you don't have peace. Notice you have peace well before you, you wield the sword. Notice you have truth well before you have faith. And these are all necessary for the progression of a mature Christian. Three, to cut the covenant. In this part, an animal is killed and they cut down the middle and the two halves are laid opposite each other. The two parties of the covenant pass between the two halves of the animal and are saying, may God do this to me and more if I break this covenant. This is not a blood covenant and cannot be broken. And so if you recall, Mo Abraham had a vision where he was, he had to walk among, uh, between the animal carcasses. And this is how this covenant part was performed with God. The biblical extension is, for by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. The Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws upon their heart and upon their mind. I will write them in their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is forgiveness for these things, there is no longer any offering for sin. The fourth stage of this covenant making is called the blood pact. You raise your right arm and cut the palm of the hand and clasp each other's hand and mingle your blood. This is saying to the other person, we are becoming one with each other. To intermingle blood is to intermingle the very life of both people. This is so important because in look in Leviticus, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. So this is how Jesus's blood can atone for us. So in the Levitical era, we used, excuse me, animals were used instead. So what the concept of substitutionary atonement in the place of my life, there was another animal that was going to take my life, but it was not, and it had to be blood. And this is the reason why Cain and Abel is such a very telling story, because as good a Cain could create produce, and vegetables, there was no blood in that. So that's the lesson that God was trying to teach there. And that's why Cain's sacrifice could never be acceptable because it was not according to God's method. And that's the reason why Cain and Abel's story is so important and so relevant for us even today. Deuteronomy 12, 23 talks about how that we should not even eat the blood of those animals. And that was part of the health laws that God instituted for the children of Israel. Step number five, you exchange one part. Each one takes a part of the other's name and incorporates it into their own. In the Bible, we talked about how Abram was no longer called Abram, but he's called Abraham. For a father have of many nations I have made thee. And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai, Thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. So God will change your name. And name, if you go into the Hebrew, is the word Shem, 
is the word is is supposed to denote even greater uh, meaning or overtones of character. So God is not just going to change your name, but it's also going to change your character. Praise God. Number six, to make a scar. The scar was an outward evidence of the covenant that others could see and know that the covenant was made. Sometimes they would rub the cut in the hand to make the scar. Then anyone who wanted to fight you would know that he had he not only had to fight you, but another as well. And so that's the, the beauty of that pact. And what is this scar, I pray tell? This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin. And it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And just note, the foreskin is supposed to be the most pleasurable part of the, the male body. And so you're basically cutting that off. And then here, notice continuing on. And every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised throughout your generations. A servant who is born in the house or who is brought who is bought with money from any foreigner who is not of your descendants. And this verse is so important because guess who showed up eight days after he was born in the temple? A baby Jesus, after which Simeon was able to see the consolation of Israel. And what's fascinating, and this is how we know that God is truly in control. The reason for eight days is because what happens is until eight days, the baby's liver cannot make clotting factors. So on day eight, that's when the clotting factors start to be created from the liver and the baby can actually stop its own bleeding. I tell you, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Notice here, continuing on Romans 2, but he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and the circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And that's kind of the, the circumcision that we ought to be search, searching for today. Number seven, both parties to a covenant stand before a witness and list all of their assets and liabilities because each one takes all of these upon him, himself. You are saying everything I have is yours and everything you have is mine. If something happens to you, your covenant partner will see to it that your wife and children are taken care of. The whole Bible represents covenant terms. There were too many to list, so I'll leave that for the Holy Spirit to lead you into that truth. Number eight, eat a memorial meal. A loaf of bread is broken in half. Each feeds his half to the other saying, this is my body and I'm now giving it to you. Then they take wine as a symbol of his blood and says, this is my blood, which is now your blood. Wow. For this is first Corinthians for I have received of which the Lord that which also I delivered unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night took which he was betrayed took and he and when he had given thanks he broke it and he said take eat this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me after the same manner he also took the cup when he had sup saying this is the cup of the New Testament in my blood. Do the, this do ye as often as ye drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. The final step is to establish a memorial. The two then plant a tree as a memorial to the covenant and sprinkle it with blood of the animal that was killed for the covenant offering. And the memorial that we know is Calvary. And we know that the blood that was sprinkled on that tree was Christ's own blood for, for the covenant. So we don't establish covenants anymore in modern society. But for the listeners and the audience in Jesus' day, this was there, there were so many overtones and everything just harmonized in the plan of salvation. For us, we have to kind of reconstruct a lot of these things because we don't live like this anymore. But this is what God originally intended for us. And this is what covenant making looks like. 
The ordinance of baptism and the Lord's Supper are two monumental pillars, one without and one within the church. Upon these ordinances, Christ has inscribed the name of the true God. My prayer is that you will you now have a profoundly new concept of what the Lord's Supper means and that you have a profoundly new concept of what a covenant means and that you will take your covenant relationship with God in a much stronger sense and to understand where you have fallen short and that the Holy Spirit might be able to lead you to understand what that looks like. Because therefore be ye also ready for in as much in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man cometh, we don't know. We know that the time is near, but we can't really tell. And as we're shifting to or closing this this sermon here, I wanted to focus on what a really good bride would do. And the best example of a, what a really good bride would do was Proverbs thirty one. So I just want to go through a couple of verses here. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price? is far above rubies, okay? So notice here, that even speaks of the dowry there, or the mohar. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. So pro uh, providing a wonderful food. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. So notice the industry. We're not just supposed to be just staying by. And I, I wanted to close with a wonderful piece of music. I hopefully you guys can hear this. And this was written by a lady. Her name is Dorothy Gertie.
And I'll close you with this last challenge that Jesus gives to his disciples. Are ye able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? And to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. This is the challenge I leave with you, that you will consider these words as you continue in your Christian walk, shall we pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you did confirm a covenant and that you want to covenant with us and that your grace is so gracious that you extend mercies to us every day. We are not worthy of this, but you loved us anyways. Help us to see this unimaginable love that you have bestowed upon us that we might be able to be transformed into that beautiful bride, the church that you so wish to be able to create. Thank you for giving us these promises and thank you for giving us these teachings that we might be able to develop and continue to mature and one day be ready for Jesus when he comes to take home his bride. Amen. Amen.